where she's a journalist, she's written many books, but she wrote this book called Get the Picture, where she spent uh, an extended amount of time in the art world of New York. She worked in a, she, uh, she worked as a security guard in uh, the Guggenheim, she worked at you know, galleries, she worked for artists, she, she stretched canvases, she went to Art Basel, she's done it all. And she wrote this incredible book, it's actually a lot of fun, we'll be selling it after the show, right over there, if you wanna buy a copy, it's called Get the Picture. Uh, so I'll just bring her right up, there you go, set that up, very professional, you know, you can put that there. Pretty good, huh? Yeah, all right. <laughs> Charlie Rose up here, huh? <laughs> yeah. without, the, without the Me Too thing. Uh, okay, anyways. <laughs> all right, so here we go. We're gonna start this off, bring up our, our guest. Please welcome the stage, Bianca Bosker, everybody. All right, so here we go. Welcome, thank you for doing the show. Thank you, thanks for having me. Thank you all for being yeah, here. Yeah, thank you guys for so being great. here. Can't do this without you. Yeah. And, and cheers to New York. You know, it's so nice to like, be here celebrating the city with all, I mean, this is so cool. I didn't pay her to say that. I really didn't, I love it. okay? That's we great. could spend 30 minutes, I'll just listen to this for 30 minutes, really. But thank you, that's very nice. Um, okay, so we're gonna do a little interview, ask you some questions, have a little conversation. Uh, and like I could tell everybody, this ain't your grandma's interview show. <laughs> These are hard hitting questions. Uh, so let's get started, here we go, <laughs> okay. Uh, first question, how are you? <laughs> uh, I'm great. Are you really? Yeah. <laughs> hey, I'll take it. I'll take it. I'm a little, little nervous. You know, a little hey, nervous. don't be nervous. Very happy to be here. We're a family here. Yeah. <laughs> that might actually make some people more nervous, so sorry. Uh, okay, here we go. So, uh, oh, let's just get into it. Okay, so you, you spent all this time in the art world. Um, I guess what possessed you to do this specific thing? Why art? Why the art world? Why galleries, etc.? Yeah, I mean, the short answer is because I didn't get it. Okay. I mean, I felt like, um, you know, I maybe, this seems like a very cultured crowd. They knew all the trivia. I would not have known that. So, you know, this may not apply to them, but I at least felt like, you know, I would go to these galleries and museums in the city, you know, with their impeccable white walls and very intense lighting and the kind of squeaky floors and hushed rooms and, like, turn the corner and find a bunch of people you know, quietly contemplating a sculpture of limp vegetables on a stained mattress. And I felt like everyone got the punchline except me. Right. And so for a long time, Art and I were not on speaking terms. And then I was actually back home, um, where I grew up in Oregon, I live here, I, I do live here now. Um, and, uh, and, and I, I discovered these paintings by my grandmother, um, and basically I just got consumed with this worry that by turning my back I'm, on art, I might be missing out on something big. And so I thought, okay, I was gonna try again with art. I started going back to galleries and museums. I figured I was older, I was wiser, maybe it would go better this time around. And in some ways it didn't. You know, For a lot sure. of the art still left me cold. But the people fascinated me. Like I'd never met a group of people willing to sacrifice so much for something of so little obvious practical value. Um, you know, like artists who treated like hundred-year-old paintings like they were as necessary as their lungs. Um, and and I was really surprised that scientists are right there with, with artists and telling us that art is a fundamental part of our humanity. Mm. You know, um, as one biologist puts it, as necessary to us as food or sex. Um, I didn't know the feeling, um, but I was intrigued. Uh, and at the same time, you know, if you spent any time around people in the arts, like, I was just transfixed. Like, their, their reality was not at all familiar to me. You know, it, it operated according to totally different rules of nature. You could say they're just weirdos. That's okay, We're, it's a <laughs> safe space here. But intriguing weirdos. Yeah, and, sure. you know, to be fair, like, they pitied me. They told yeah. me that I lacked visual literacy, which they said was downright dangerous in a world so saturated with images. Um, and I... Wow. Really was, you know, I, I did become like consumed by this question of like whether I could see art, whether I could see the world the way they did and what might change. Mm -hmm. And so I, I, I tend, I, I consider myself someone obsessed with obsession and I guess I have my own obsessive streak. And so I decided like, I, I wasn't just gonna do interviews and write research, you know, read research papers. I wanted to go and work in the art world and see what I would learn and report back. And no one except me thought that was a good idea. And how long were you there? How long did you spend? Um, you know, the whole process was about five-ish years. Wow. Yeah, wow. I, and then getting access, part of it was getting access was really tough. Like, you know, I, I've done reporting in China where, you know, talking to a foreign journalist can get you arrested, and nothing prepared me for how secretive the art world would be. I mean, I had a much easier time getting answers in Chengdu than in Chelsea. And, um, you know, I, like, it was, it was really striking. I think for me, based on, maybe I was naive, but 
I think based on everything that the art world advertises about itself, I expected to find this group of like free thinking iconoclasts who wanted to, you know, embrace as many people as possible in the warm hug of art. Sure. And it wasn't until later that I discovered how wrong I was. I mean, I felt like an FBI agent trying to get in with the mob. I started showing up asking pretty basic questions. And instead of answers, I got threats. You know, of course. Warnings. You know, people told me what I wanted to do was impossible, maybe even dangerous. Definitely, it was very, made very clear to me that if I enjoyed my life as it was in New York, this was not a good path to go down. Yeah, I mean, that you gotta, you gotta uh, definitely heed those threats from, from uh, gallerists and artists because they might tell you you lack visual literacy. <laughs> <laughs> those are not empty threats. Yeah, yeah. I, know, oh, I forgot to put this words. up here. There's you, there's a book. I forgot to put that up. I'm not, you know, there's I got a life juggling with things. Oh, the, a worm, a bookworm. 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 Oh, got it, yeah. Yeah, you know, a lot of, that's art. <laughs> you know, yeah. Some would say that's art. The meaning behind that, metaphor. Okay, anyways. Let's keep it moving. All right, here we go. So, so you, you, uh, I guess you preface what you did and how you spent the time. So you were talking about you know, the experience of art. So this is interesting, and I think this is one of the things about art theory that interests me so much, is there's the definition <laughs> of art. I know, sorry. I've never heard anyone don't say that they're so interested in art theory, but. <laughs> all right, uh, well, uh, you lack visual literacy, all right? So, <laughs> now we know so why. we're even. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, here's the here's the uh, here's the question. So I think what's interesting too is there's there's a there's a difference between the definition of art and the experience of art, and I right. think people can get and you talk about both obviously in this, and I think that was kind of one of your like breakthroughs at the end. The experience is a personal subjective one, but you deal so much with the definition of it. And I talked a little bit about it in Chelsea and the galleries and everything. Could you talk a little bit about that? Because I think a lot of people, like you said, are confused. They walk in, they're like, "Should I be seeing something? Am I supposed to be seeing something? Am I doing something wrong?" What does the book say about this? And I think that's an interesting thing that a lot of people have a hard time with, especially in New York where it's expected of you to know, you know? Right, so I think first of all, you know, like I said, visual literacy is sort of synonymous with developing an eye. And this for me, this was a journey to develop my eye. And an eye in the art connoisseur sense doesn't just mean like the organ, right? It is this painstakingly cultivated outlook that enables you to see a lot that doesn't meet the eye. Like, who will be the next Warhol? Or like, what is transcendent about a sculpture of like a brutalized chair? Um, and I think that, you know, that was for me a real goal. Now, what was interesting is that, I, you know, I did eventually get this gig, um, the first of several gigs working at galleries, but I started at this very cool up and coming gallery in Brooklyn, um, sort of, you know, out of the way spot for the in the know. And uh, it became clear to me that, you know, sort of all the ways that I think the art world uses sort of strategic snobbery to keep people out. And I think that does apply also to our experience of art, of, of developing our eye. Um, my boss pulled me aside. It wasn't, it wasn't just that I lacked visual literacy. He told me that, um, I hate to break it to you, but you're not the coolest cat in the art world, so having you around is just like, it's lowering my coolness. So he uh, suggested a makeover, you know, severe haircut. High school jewelry. all over again, good lord. Worse. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, suggested I tone down my superficial enthusiasm. Um, if any of you have spent time in the art world, you do know that true art connoisseurs exclusively discuss art in an affectless monotone that makes them sound like they're running out of batteries. Um, I so, thought that, speaking to that point real quick, I thought it was really funny in your book, you talked about the Gagosian Gallery. Oh, yes. Which is one of the biggest, like a billion dollar gallery. They have multiple locations, and you, you talked about how the. the they have specific instructions on, on answering how to answer the answer phone. The phone. Yes. They actually yes. they have you record yourself answering the phone Practicing. and coach you as yeah. to how you can say it perfectly when you pick up the phone and say, Gagosian. Yeah. You have to you say it right. You didn't do it right. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, welcome to Gagosian. Is that right? <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, you don't want the, the instructions. Yeah, former yeah. assistant was like, when she got the job, her boss was basically like, record yourself, practice it, listen back to your recording. Sort of a downward inflection, like Gagosian. Um, but the point was, you do not want to sound happy, but you don't want to sound dead. So it's the sort of like intermediate point. Um, but yes, you know, intonation, word choice. Um, it was made clear to me, you know. Um, Certain words were off limits, so like a work is not sold, it's placed. True. Um, fluency in art speak is rather key, so uh, I apologize if you have, are familiar with art speak, you know, it's this overly complex way of speaking where the bigger the word, the better. So um, what an art critic calls the indexical marks of the artist's body would be 
finger painting to you and me. Um, and, you know, basically, like, art speak did not evolve to be a clear form of communication. There's a study that found that um, Art World press releases use the words spatial and non-spatial interchangeably. Um, but, you know, it is this exclusionary code that essentially distinguishes you as someone who does or does not get it. Now, there's a whole other, you know, host of ways that I began to learn about how the art world kind of keeps out the Joe Schmoes, which was my boss's term for general public, um, where you put your galleries, you know, a lot of them, if, you, if you've gone, if you've tried to find them, you know, a lot of them are located less like stores than speakeasies, like up a flight of yeah. stairs in a building that could house apartments. Um, they don't have the inflatable guy going like this in the yes, front. Yes, no, they do they not have that. I've often thought that would be helpful. Um, right, and, and, you know, yes, like ground floor spaces are expensive, but as one dealer explained to me, also undesirable because then you have to deal with random ass people walking in. Nice. Well, so, this gets to the ran, this gets also to the definition part that I was talking about. So these people are basically purposely trying to cultivate a certain definition of what art is and who consumes that art, right? Right. And what is sort of the right way to engage with right. it, and sort of like how you should be around it. And I do think that these deliberately er erected barriers to entry apply not just to finding the art or buying it, but also to appreciating right. it, which goes back to your sort of definition and experience with art. So, like I said, I was consumed with developing my eye. I eventually like, gave up my whole, you know, I was a total deadbeat to everyone who knows me. You know, I worked as a you know, security guard. I got my face sat on by a, an artist in the name of art. Um, and you and you know, I was book. willing to, like, okay, to everybody. try everything. <laughs> and, um, How's that for teaser there, huh? <laughs> but, but I think what really frustrated me was that, you know, these art connoisseurs that I was, that I was meeting, they spent surprisingly little time discussing the merits of the art itself. And instead, they asked, you know, where did this artist go to school? Who else owns the work? Uh, who is he sleeping with? And that's the so-called context around the work, right? That kind of web of names around an artist, this sort of social capital. And all of that seemed to influence people's judgment of the work so much more than the stuff itself, the stuff, you know, the, the artworks. Um, and, and that didn't sit well with me. I think that that felt like in trying to develop my eye, I was being encouraged to outsource it to the hive mind. It also feels like, one more way to, um, you know, exclude concentrate. Yeah, exclude and have people. cool yeah. kids and totally, all that stuff. Because yeah. like these people become so much more important. Right. If we're told that we need like an advanced degree and the right pair of jeans to commune with an artwork. Right. So you know, it wasn't really until I started working with artists that I think I began to discover a different way of engaging with art, and that was one that was that really meant staying in the work. And I think kind of an approach that's unpopular a bit right now within the realm of art theory, which is sort of paying attention to the physical form. I think the last, you know, 100 years or so, basically since Marcel Duchamp took a urinal and stuck it you know, on a pedestal and declared it an artwork, we've stressed that what really matters about an artwork is the idea behind it, right? The thought trumps the thing. And I think working with artists, you know, I was stretching canvases and painting backgrounds and washing brushes and, um, you know, seeing artists work, you realize, like, making art is, it's practically athletic, right? It is blistery, it gets bloody, I lost, like, patches of arm hair to a sculpture. Um, and as, a, as one of the artists, Julie Curtis, that I worked with, stressed, like, an idea is not a painting. Painting is constant decision making. And so I think that that, for me, was a real way into the piece, and, and one, into pieces, and one that I think, um, I don't know, I, I just found really exciting and empowering. You know, it meant, like, I, I started ignoring the wall labels. When I worked as a guard, I actually, like, stood in front of the wall labels so people couldn't read them. Um, because really, I think that it's, like, it's all about staying in the work. It's paying attention to those decisions, and that allows you to, like, you know, see art face to face and on your own terms. Yeah, and I, I think that's, that's true, and I think uh, it's interesting because, I guess, here, it, I think it, in like growing up and going to school, when we, we were going to like, you know, school growing up, people don't, they don't focus much on art. They focus on sciences and what's gonna make you money and you know, math and science, all this stuff, but art kind of takes a back seat. And there was actually a great quote uh, that I, I, re I read. <laughs> I read books. <laughs> you guys ever heard of Tolstoy? He wrote, he wrote a great book called What is Art? And in it he says that science teaches us how to think, but art teaches us how to feel. And I think that we're doing us all a very big disservice by not becoming more fluent with art and how to appreciate it and how to appreciate beauty because that's a whole part of our existence that we're not kind of developing. Yeah. And I thought you kind of hit on that a little bit too. Uh, I don't know if you could talk a little bit more about that in the terms of like appreciation of beauty. And you talk about that when you were actually, in the books you talk about it because you were a, a guide. I'm sorry, not a guide, a, a guard at the Guggenheim. <laughs> she was a guard at the Guggenheim. You just sat around art all the time. So, I mean, I did other stuff too. Yeah, sure. 
I didn't mean you were a bad employee. I don't know if your boss is here or something. What's going on? But uh, but yeah. Yeah. No, I think that. So first of all, I mean, I who am I to disagree with Tolstoy? But I think art teaches us to feel and think. You know, I don't I don't think it's at all mutually exclusive. Um, but I will say that yeah, like so. You know, I think that what's fascinating to me is that I do think that artists and scientists have actually come to similar conclusions about why art is so fundamental to our humanity. And it is, right? Like art is, it is ancient, right? It is one of our oldest forms of expression. Uh, we invented, you know, we were painting long before we could write. Um, one of our most universal urges, right? We all engage with art, whether we're like preschoolers or Paleolithic humans or Parisians. Regions. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, when you think about what it does for us, um, when we look out at the world, right, like we do not see like video cameras, right? We do not look around like objectively and dispassionately taking in the scene around us. Our brains are trash compactors. Like they are the big garbage trucks, you know, that we see rumbling through the city, um, just like sh smashing stuff in, right? We have these filters of expectation that descend when we look out at the world and are preemptively like sorting, dismissing, categorizing, you know, compressing all of the raw data coming in even before we get the full picture. And like I said, artists and scientists have each in their own ways come to this conclusion that what art does is really to help us fight the reducing tendencies of our mind. Um, and so what art does, you know, it's not always pleasant. It, certainly it can be beautiful, but sometimes it's just, it's off-putting, it's disturbing, it's sad. But what it is doing consistently is introducing a glitch into our brains. And that glitch is a gift. It is one that helps our minds jump the curb. It's one that you know, teaches them how to kind of get out of their well-worn pathways. Um, and so I came to feel that like there's really an artist in each of us to the extent that we struggle to keep our brains from compressing our felt experience of the world. Um, art, you know, it's not just a thing. I think we can talk more about the definition of, of art. I mean, when I met this artist, Mandy Allfire, um, who's an ass influencer who I met because she sat on my face, you know, really got me thinking about the definition of art and what it is, right? Someone was spaced out for like two seconds and like, what? Huh? I was sending this text, what? Did I miss something? Um, but she, you know, that experience we can talk about, like really, I think expanded my, my definition of art, but at the same time, I do think that like there is background. By the way, this Mandy Allfire is an MFA, right? She, she has an MFA. Yeah, so Mandy. She's an MFA. She's an actual like real artist, and she did this kind of as an experiment in a way, kind of that. It's was, a, no, it's performance. It's performance piece. art. It's performance, performance, performance. But she yeah. she wanted to go into this new route and and is and is committed to it. And, yeah. So basically, yeah. she is. Um, so Mandy Allfire, her, her offline name is Amanda Alfieri, but um, it's at Thug Life Thick Baby. If anyone you know wants to engage <laughs> with art on their phones, um, and uh, all the so, guys are like, oh yeah, I follow her. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so basically, like, anyway, so she, yeah, she has an MFA from Columbia. She's performed at some of, you know, the most, like, storied arts venues in the country. Um, and basically, I learned about her because an artist invited me to go to her opening. And I didn't know anything about her work except what was in the press release. And according to the press release, Mandy Allfire had spent the last few years performing on Instagram as an ass influencer. And again, this crowd is too cultured to know this, but an ass influencer is essentially an influencer who has like, you know, hundreds of thousands, if not millions of followers that they have gained by posting copious photos of their butts. And so she, for this opening and for this, you know, was doing a performance piece where she had invited her followers to come to the gallery to have their faces sat on until, and I quote, they can't take it anymore. And so anyway, I got there, the art was already happening. She was, you know, sitting on this, you know, sort of like naked manatee of a man in his leopard print underwear and, um, you know, sort of like gently bouncing on his face. And uh, next thing I knew, I had volunteered and, you know, like darkness descended. And, um, <laughs> you know, I think that it was perhaps un un not unsurprisingly, like I couldn't stop thinking about her work. Um, and I think part of it was that like- Shock. You know, her, what a coincidence. <laughs> um, I think part of it was that like her process was very immersive. You know, right. my process is very immersive. Um, I also think, you know, to your point, <laughs> no one's buying it. But, um, <laughs> but I, and I think that also, you know, like to your point about beauty, beauty is, kind of a dirty word in the art world these days. I think even in polite society generally, it is, there's this suspicion that beauty is corrupted and corrupting, um, you know, 
falling for it as sort of a sign of moral weakness. I got so many lectures about like the evils of the B word. And you know, I think the book is, I think the book is ultimately a love story about art, but I also think it's kind of a defense of beauty. And I, and I think beauty is in so many more places than we realize, and art helps us see that. But I'll just say that like, artists always would tell me that the point of art is to make you feel uncomfortable. And yet when it came to Mandy Allfire's work, the consensus was too uncomfortable. And that was interesting to me. And so anyway, I started spending time with her and, and working sort of as her assistant. And, you know, we, we were getting together and, and having a lot of really thorny conversations around what is art. And I think she helped me get to this place of seeing art in so many more places than I would have before. Like art ultimately, like our idea of what art is today is the product of these rather arbitrary decisions made by status conscious Europeans in the 1760s who essentially like elevated fine art onto this sort of pedestal from which it's waved smugly at craft ever since. And so we have this, we still live, you know, we're in the hangover of that dis really arbitrary distinction where we, you know, fine art is sort of like poetry, painting, sculpture, architecture, and that is supposed to move our souls, right? That is, that is made by geniuses. It is deep. It is thought provoking. It moves us. But everything else, like a needlepoint pillow or a chair, you know, is just stuff. It's useful. It doesn't do it for us. Um, but really, you know, if you go even further back in time, art used to be anything requiring human ingenuity and skill. Um, you know, training horses, passing laws, making paintings. So, you know, I think that what was striking to me about spending time with artists was the way that they ab were able to look at everything with this art mindset. You know, they could like go out, like, like Julie would go out and just like take inspiration from looking at a motorcycle parked on the side of the street or, you know, a, I don't know, like a, one of those, those cold antiseptic lobbies in the new developments in Brooklyn. And I, I think that there's that ability, like- a Plumber's crack, a good plumber's crack. <laughs> <laughs> and there's, you know, the, there's that ability to like, you know, look at the everyday, the way that we look at art, right, with this extra beat, with this willingness to like linger on why and how and just sort of like ponder how wonderfully impossible the things are around us. And I think that that process, right, again, I think art is so many more things than we realize, but I also do believe that each of us is an artist in, again, that way that we, we try and fight the reducing tendencies of our mind. And, and art really does help us do that. You know, art is a choice. Um, it's a fight against complacency. Uh, it's a decision to live a life that's richer and more beautiful and co more complex. I mean, look at the, you know, how many, do you, do you all know the, like, the wastewater, uh, what is that, the New Newtown Creek wastewater treatment facility, the shit tits, like, the digester eggs? Yeah, like, Julie, I mean, you know, I remember I came into the studio one day and she was like, I just, I want to paint them, I want them to be in my paintings, they're so beautiful. And sort of like the words, you know, sexy and halitosis, like I'd never thought of the words sewage and beautiful in the same sentence. But the more I worked with her, I mean, eventually, like, to me, they're, some of, they're, they're one of the most beautiful buildings on the New York skyline. It's in they're Greenpoint, incredible. by the way. In Greenpoint, there's like a sewage treatment plant, and these two, like, they look like, they look like shit, they're called just the shit tits, yeah. because they are the wastewater, <laughs> and they look like boobs. Uh, yeah, they're like the glowing eggs. I yeah. mean, they're just amazing. But I think it's, you know, art does, you know, I think it helps us fi like find beauty in so many more places. It opens us up to like the nuance, the chaos, and the beauty of the world around us. Yeah, and I think you're right in the sense that it challenges you. And I think at the end of the day, every human is creative. We're all like, I think that's part of the human nature is to be creative at the very least to be creative in our own life and what our life is, which is why so many people feel angst and they feel stu stuffed up or whatever, or suffocated because they don't have an ability to express that freedom and, and create their own life. And I think art kind of challenges you to do that, which is one of the reasons why people see art as dangerous too. You know, you have books that are, you know, uh, pulled or banned and things like that, or not allowed to see paintings and all this stuff, because it does that exact thing, it makes you think about things in a different way. And you know, and all that, I guess too, to say that Mandy Allfire taught you this by sitting on your face. Yeah, 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 totally. Yeah. Yeah. And we got a surprise for you. Uh, we're gonna run it back. Mandy, come on out here. Uh, let's get that massage table out here. Uh, wow, that's, that's very interesting. Um, okay, well, look, I, I got some, uh, we got the real stuff, the serious stuff here out of the way. I wanted to talk to you, well, actually, one more thing. There was a piece that you mentioned in your book that you stood next to all the time in yeah. the Guggenheim. Yeah. I'm gonna show it to you guys. This is called, uh, the, oh, this. No, 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 tell them. Okay, I won't don't tell, tell I won't tell them, I won't tell them. This, okay, so this is a piece, I know you guys are always like, oh my God. <laughs> But yeah, this was a piece by Brancusi. Yeah. You stood next to it for a very long time in the Guggenheim. You guys are looking at this like, what the hell is that? 
Uh, why don't you take it away? I mean, uh, in a minute or two, explain explain to this, please, because this she went through a whole thing with this with this piece. We have a we, we have a deep relationship. Yeah. This piece and I, yes. So um, so I ended up working as a security guard at the Guggenheim in part because I mean many reasons, but one of the things I was curious about was what would it be like to just be around art for you know w without any possibility of escape? You know, like what would that do to my eye? And um, I will tell you that you know when I started working as a guard, I was so freaking bored. I would just, I would get up there and just like pray for someone to touch a work so I could tell them not to do it. <laughs> um, and eventually, like, you know, I started to get a little more creative and, and, I, and I started giving myself these exercises. And I would tell myself, okay, you've got 40 minutes on each post, 40 minutes until you move to the next one. And I would challenge myself to just spend 40 minutes looking at one artwork. And um, we developed, like I said, a very intense relationship. And so I started looking at this work and, you know, 40 minutes would go by. And there was an artist that I had spent time with who, whose advice on engaging with work was just to notice five things about a piece. And they didn't have to be grandiose. It was not like, you know, I don't know, like this is a meditation on like climate change in the early, you know, I don't know, like industrial revolution. It was just like, man, like it's literally, I was like, it's just so like soft, like I just want to squeeze it. You know what I mean? Um, or I don't know, like, like, it, I, just some, I was like, it looks like a lipstick that got cut off. I mean, it just anything. It's just just noticing five things. It's stay again, staying in the work. So this piece, um, I think, was really moving for me because it was the first time I, I really recognized what I can only describe as love for an artwork. You know, this feeling that I could be around it for as long as I could see into the future and not be sick of its company. And that wasn't true for every piece. You know, I picked like. You know, I, I got in some like spats with some of these ab abstract expressionist pieces um, that I thought were really annoying, and you know there was a whole photo show that was just like, ugh, I mean, just nothing. Like I, I, I eventually just stopped being able to find new things on some of these pieces, and they drove me crazy. But you know, this piece it would just it would change so much, and I think it really helped me kind of, I guess, inform my own approach to looking at art, whether it's at a gallery or museum. And I think that the first piece is to ignore the wall label. So this is a piece where I would stand. I would really try and stand in front of the wall labels because people would read that the tombstone is essentially is, that's the, the, the you know the technical term for the label that includes you know the artist's name, the title of the piece, when it was made, the materials, and people would look take one look at that and it would just cut off their interpretation. You know, it would just totally interrupt it. And you know, I will say of the also, name, right? The name because the, the, the name. I will, I will tell you the, yeah. the name of it later. Um, <laughs> You know, but the other thing is to just slow down, right? There are studies that show that um, we spend about four times longer reading the wall label in an artwork than actually looking at the work itself, which is a measly eight seconds versus two seconds. Um, and you know, like slow looking is just so worthwhile. I mean, 40 minutes, hours. I used to go to museums and I used to feel like scorched earth viewing was like the only way to get your money's worth. Like I had to see every single thing in the, in the museum. I had to like just lay eyes on it, like check, 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 check. And I now, I really believe that that's sort of like going to an all you can eat buffet and then, you know, wondering why you feel sick after you've eaten like sushi, waffles, and mimosa, and like, you know, french fries. Right? <laughs> like really, I mean, if you, I think if you go to a museum, if you go to a gallery and you just find one thing and you commune with that thing, you do not have to like everything. As I talk about in the book, like the way that things end up in these museums is it's self a mess. I mean, these are decisions being made by individuals who are biased and subjective, like Money. any of us. Yeah. And so anyway, this piece, you know, I would just So what's kept, the name of it? Did well, I'm gonna say I just kept walking around and like I would challenge people to tell me <laughs> we gotta, we gotta what they the name saw <laughs> in the piece. But why does it even matter? It doesn't matter what well, the piece is. Oh, like, yeah. you know, it doesn't matter what no, the piece is. No, but I'm sure is. everyone's curious. And also we gotta get out of here soon. Yeah, so I don't anyway. Kinda, yeah. anyway, so people would see, but you know, if they didn't see the name of the piece, they would just see incredible things. Yeah. They were like, it's you know, it's a woman giving birth, it's a it's a high heel, it's someone pooping, it's you know, like um, it's toothpaste coming out of a tube, it's like an erection. It's a fingernail. It's like, you know, it's this a Kurosawa character. Like people would come up with these incredible visions of what it was. And then when they, otherwise, if they just read the label, the, the name of the piece is Miracle parentheses Seal. Seal. And they'd be like, mm. oh, it's a seal. Cool. Yeah. And then move on. And that would be it. And so I guess that was just so sad. It was heartbreaking for me when that would happen. Well, it's a good thing we didn't open up to guessing what it was. <laughs> Someone yelled out like, butt plug number three. I don't know. Uh, yeah, I mean, right? it, it's, a, it's, a, it's an interesting piece, I'll say that. That's, yeah. uh, okay, so we only have time for a few rapid-fire questions, but we got to go to the rapid-fire questions. It's time for the rapid-fire questions. <laughs> Look at our faces are on fire, huh? 
All right, let's do it. Let's cover a couple of these and see what you think. All right, since you lived in New York, you were an author, let's go with the first one. And try, let's, try to, let's try to get through as many as we can. Okay, first one. What's the craziest thing you've ever seen in New York? I mean, getting my face sat on is definitely the That's craziest, yeah. Fair. I'm not going to argue there. Let's keep it moving. All right, cool. Uh, next one. What's your favorite art piece? Oh my god! Well, I love this one, obviously. That's that's it. I love this. And also, there's like there's this, Paul Cadmus has the seven deadly sins in the basement of the Met, and they are so grotesque and absurd and so like kind of wonderfully kitschy compared to everything else in the Met's collection. They make me so happy. Nice. That's cool. All right. Well, keep it moving. Uh, if you were to be anything other than an, a writer, what would you be? Ooh, a firefighter. Really? Yeah. That's my answer. <laughs> I was gonna say Firefighters firefighter too. Firefighters are so. Cool. They're it's so like cool, amazing. and they have the best schedules on the planet. I didn't know that. They work like three days, and that's it. And they uh, hang out at the firehouse. <laughs> <laughs> Any firefighters here? Yeah? yeah. Oh, nice, man. Let's talk. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I, my job's done. <laughs> hey, look at that. That's some good interviewing. Okay, let's keep it going. Uh, what's your guilty pleasure, art-wise? I mean, come on. I just, I don't believe in a guilty pleasure. It's all pleasure. I know. Um, but I think that, like, I would say that my, my like, comfort food of art is going to the Met and getting lost. Like, just going to the Met, having no agenda, and just, like, seeing where I end up. Like, it's always wonderful. It's always brilliant. It's always moving. Um, and it's, you know, it's the freaking Met. It's the freaking Met. <laughs> That's what it says on the sign outside. <laughs> All right, let's keep it moving. Uh, what's your favorite place in New York City? Ooh. Mm. I have a, the, the Chrysler Building is very special to me. I've never been in the Chrysler Building. Really? Even in the lobby? I don't think so. Wow. Um, but I just, like, I see it, and I'm like, that's why I live here. <laughs> and you've never been inside. I guess that's I, cool. I love it. That's really you cool. Know, you, just you, you don't want to spoil it. You don't want to spoil it. You, no. spoil it. you got some so security beautiful. guard yelling at you? What the hell? I'm not going to, you know... <laughs> No, that's true. You know, that actually used to be a trick. There's a little insider, insider baseball. Uh, back in the day, there used to be a dentist's office near the top floor, and people would you go in and be like... You spoiled it. You see? Like, there's a dentist in the no, top but, floor. But, but people would go in and say to the front desk, they're like, oh, we're going to the, the dentist. Uh, I got a dentist appointment. And so they'd let you into the elevator bank. You go up to the top and get some views. Huh? Yeah, well, look at that. You can, can try that. It's all just tell, like... tell them Tom sent you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But yeah, okay, uh, we'll do another one here, let's go. What's, the, uh, what's your advice for aspiring artists? Ooh, ooh, me, from me? Yes. I mean, look, I think, who, like, who am I to give advice to aspiring You're a writer, artists? that's like, art. Just... <laughs> Come on. <laughs> no, I mean, I think, look, I think that the, I, I think part of it is just like, you know, I don't know, you keep going, right? Like, you keep doing it, you keep making it. Yep. I mean, it's, it's so, it's so hard, and I think you have to find your community. I mean, look, I think that, I wrote this book, you know, kind of in the hope that it would help aspiring artists. I think that there's, as I said before, like, there's, the, the art world prides itself on being opaque. It, it views secrecy as key to its survival. And I think that, you know, I see this book as sort of like part user guide to the hidden logic of the art world, part quest to learn how to, you know, live life more expansively. And I do, I, I don't know, I really, I do feel like there's a lot that hopefully is, um, that kind of explains how the rules work inside of it. And I do think that that's, only fair. I mean, I just, I can't tell you how frustrating it was and how many artists I heard from. Like, people who had spent years more in this world than I had, had so much more at stake and really didn't understand, like, basic kind of, you know, just basic facts about, like, how to build a career there. You know, they were just so locked out from that information. I'd be like, how do you get a show? And, you know, they'd run a gallery for 12 years and they were like, I have no idea. Right. Um, and I think that that is, you know, look, I'm not saying that the way that the game is played is right, but I think that it's at least fair for people to know the rules. And so that for me was a big part of, part of the book, was just to feel like it's there, right? To try and like, like lay out the rules of the game so that people can kind of break those rules and come up with new rules and come up with new ways to play it. So I don't know, but I do think that like, yeah, I also think my advice is also for those of us who look at art. I do think that part of developing our eye means trusting ourselves so that we aren't outsourcing our taste right. to context, you know, that we learn to trust ourselves. Right now, like, the art world is this, like, winner-take-all model where we're, like, fighting over the same small, you know, a small number of people are, like, trading the same small number of artists for greater and greater sums of money. Like, we should spend less time with 
the masterpieces. Like, yes, museums are amazing, but I think that like we need to get out, we need to like see the undiscovered works, the uncelebrated works, the surprising works. You know, go to art schools, go to the gallery in the basement, go to the gallery in someone's living room. Mm. Buy this book after the show <laughs> over there. You said it. But no, I think that like but really I think that, you know, Taste is a journey. Mm -hmm. With new tastes comes a new self. That's the exciting part. So I think a key part of developing our eye is, you know, thinking for ourselves and just seeing more. Sure. No, I agree. And I think you, you hit it at the beginning. I think the, the best advice you could give an art, aspiring artist is don't quit. Yeah. Like really, like, I mean, you wouldn't, you wouldn't hire, if you had a choice between two people to fix your sink, you pick the guy who's 100% committed to being a plumber over the other one who's just dabbling any day. Find a way to get to that place. Find a way to just commit your entire life to the one thing you want to do, and it's, it's a journey, but don't quit and find a way to do it. Anyways, I got one, one more question. It's a yes or no question, very simple. Uh, so here we go, last question, most important question of the night. Will you be my friend? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. That was super easy. All right, real quick, I got something. I'm going to grab this from, from the back here. One second, I, I forgot to bring it out when I was here. Sorry about that. I'm gonna, I, because you're an artist, I, I got you. Oh, oh, thank you. So this is because you're an artist. Thank I got you some art that you can hang up at home. I got you this picture <laughs> of the dabbing rat, the famous dabbing rat. Yeah. yeah. Guys, give it up for Bianca Bosker, everybody. Thank you so much, Bianca. Yeah, of course, friend. Thank you. All right. <laughs>